This game is rated M and is intended for mature audiences. Everything was moving in a positive direction. The stupidly optimistic scenario I had sketched out in my imagination was coming closer and closer to reality. I'm waiting for the butt! My mother's recovery produced clear changes in my own emotions. I'd barely spoken to anyone in the weeks since Toshi-san's death, but I was slowly beginning to communicate with those around me. My grandparents still kept their distance, but if I approached them myself using my mother as a pretext, I could at least get them to have a conversation with me. Jeez Louise. Mom's recovery was their primary objective, after all. They couldn't avoid hearing me out if I brought it up. Watching my grandparents interact with me, despite obvious reluctance, I felt as if I'd achieved a small but significant rebellion against the people who'd spent years ignoring my very existence. I'm right here. I'm in an, in an, I'm in an important position. More than anything else, that sense of meaning gave me strength. In school, the others still rejected my very existence, but that didn't bother me much anymore. I would be returning to the Sakaki house once my mother recovered. This hollow school life would soon be over. The end was in sight. That suffocating feeling of entrapment was gone. No matter what they said about me, no matter how they laughed, it rolled off me harmlessly. Three days before my mother was scheduled to leave the hospital, I was hurrying to school through the rain. The drizzle that had begun a little after midnight was picking up into a steady, heavy rain as I left the house. My umbrella wasn't enough to catch it all. This is so we got a new storm! This is probably going to be where something traumatic happens that causes her to hate thunderstorms from that point on. Pausing for a moment, I glanced up at the angry sky beyond the edge of my umbrella. It was covered in a deep black clouds from the horizon to the horizon, without so much as a patch of clear sky in between. Since our conversation the other day, Mom had begun to spend a lot of time looking out her window. That was nice enough when the weather was clear, but staring up at a menacing sky like that might inspire a bit of gloominess just as her feelings were finally starting to take an upward swing. I'd have to hurry to the hospital to cheer Mom up as soon as school was over. With that thought, I began to walk again. <laughs> and just as I reached to the intersection between the road to school and the main street leading to the station, a familiar face appeared from around the corner. So I'll help me if this is that stupid reporter dip again. It is stupid reporter dip again! Uh, Bruh! Take the freaking hint! He's the No, he's not the worst. He In a game of terrible people, he's not even close to being the worst. What's the saddest part about the Fruit of Grisea? The thought that I have to stream it again next week. Oh, no! I'm, I'm kidding. The saddest part was probably when Michiru's cat died. That was That was hard to read. Yeah. Also, we still... I want to point out, we haven't had a car accident in this route yet. We've had five car accidents in the game up to this point. I, there's going to be another. <laughs> they discharge her mom to the hospital, and then she immediately gets run over by a car. <laughs> but it wasn't a face I was eager to see. I instantly recognized the tabloid reporter who had once wheedled me into becoming a source for an article that mixed fragments of truth with innuendo and lies. Standing under a large jet black umbrella that seemed to mirror the rain clouds above, he looked me over with a faint smile on his face. Bruh. Bruh, you should knock it off. <laughs> See, Yumiko, this is why you need to carry a fox taser with you. <laughs> his words seemed to have grown even greasier and more presumptuous than before. When I walked past him silently, the reporter fell easily in beside me, keeping pace as though I'd invited him to follow. Oh, sure. Yeah. Bruh! What? He... Why do you not take the hint? Hey, Dip. It was incredibly unpleasant to have this man bring up that topic now. The Sakaki House was the invisible mass around which we all orbited. I knew my current lifestyle was possible only because of his financial support, but sometimes I couldn't help feeling a powerful burst of resentment toward the father I barely knew. That's understandable, because he's been a real terrible father. <laughs> In particular, when people carelessly assumed we must have some kind of a relationship. Well, 
Stopping briefly, I spat out the clearest possible rejection, then quickly turned around to leave. I couldn't allow trouble of this sort to arise so soon before Mom was to leave the hospital. There was no telling how speaking to this man for even the briefest of moments might come back to haunt me. The reporter, no longer trying to follow, called out to me from behind. His words were suggestive, his tone unusually serious. I came to a halt despite myself. Rationally, I understand. It would have been the same either way. I know that it wasn't the cause of what would follow. But still, somewhere deep down inside, I can't help believing everything would have been different if only I had walked away. Oh, really? So he did have an affair. What? <laughs> this is the worst possible news! We need the really dark music! When I turned back to face him, the man was wiping at his rain-damp forehead with a knowing smirk on his face. What is this? This guy is such a dip. <laughs> the reporter reached out and presented me with a magazine, already open to a certain article. Practically grabbing it from his hands, I ran my eyes frantically across the page. And the moment I saw the headline, the blood in my veins seemed to freeze solid. East Beach Express President Sakaki Michiaki's illegitimate child? Oh, this is a tabloid. There's no truth to this. Well, on the waited son born to a mistress. Bold sans serif headlines, emphasized by sharp decorative flourishes. Blow the face of a man I hadn't seen in a while, lined up with the portrait of his unfamiliar partner. Paragraphs full of vicious words that I could barely stand to read. And at the very end, one sentence that plunged me below even despair. As I had doubted my ears in a hospital room weeks before, this time I doubted my eyes. Currently arranging for a divorce from his wife. Those few brief words, buried in the final paragraph as if it was the most trivial thing in the world, hit me with the force of a hurricane. I'd heard the rumors. I more or less understood that Father was that sort of person. But there was no worse way to have those suspicions confirmed. They're not confirmed! This is a tabloid! They can- they literally just make stuff up. Why? Why now when my mother was recuperating in the hospital? Why now when she was finally getting better? Was this article even true? Probably not! Probably not. Many thoughts swirled chaotically from my head. My hands trembled and lost their hold on the hateful piece of paper. <laughs> The magazine fell to the wet pavement with a slap, and it, as it hit the ground, the pages that had been folded back flipped around, revealing the cover. And as if to turn the dagger in my wound, one final piece of information was revealed to me. A tasteful work from a well-known painter, behind a number of carefully arranged headlines and a firm serif typeface. A weekly magazine, but one that clearly distinguished itself from the tabloids and gossip rags. A magazine of some credibility. Oh, well, it's still kind of a tabloid. A magazine my mother asked for every week. <laughs> Bruh, you really... F <laughs> you really think that I'm gonna talk to a goon like you? <laughs> Charging off the sidewalk that ran alongside the prefectural highway, I sprinted all out along the farm, a farm road, slanted diagonally along through the fields of green. The path didn't turn toward my school, so it offered an ever so slightly more direct route. But it was the only a farm road. In places, it hadn't even been paved. It was an extremely difficult course to run on a rainy day. But I didn't have the luxury of worrying about that right at the moment. I needed to get to the hospital as soon as I possibly could. I needed to stop my mother. With the recent improvement in her condition, Mom had started to leave her room and visit the hospital store to purchase her own books and magazines. If the nurses were still delivering them with the mail, there was at least a chance they'd check for articles that might upset her. But it was hard to imagine the clerks in the shop would have been told to do the same. <laughs> Halfway there, I could no longer muster the effort to keep my umbrella up right above me. I let the rain strike me and focused all my attention on running. Water went flying with every heavy stride, slapping against my legs, soaking my skirt. 
The small ember of satisfaction warming my chest only minutes before I'd been smothered completely out of existence. I was cold to my very core. <laughs> I don't care! My momentum barely slowed after arriving at the hospital. I understood perfectly well that running in the hallways was off limits, but the rules I'd always obeyed mattered less than reaching my destination even a moment sooner. Turning a corner on the third floor, I finally entered a wing reserved for the private rooms. A moment later, my feet came to an abrupt halt. There was something unusual going on in front of that familiar door. For a moment, I was simply bewildered. Three strange men in expensive suits were standing just outside my mother's room, talking to each other, just on the verge of entering. A vague but powerful sense of dread ran through my body like a jolt of electricity. I shouted angrily as I approached. The man, who had been reaching for the door, hesitated. Before I could continue, the white-haired man at the head of the little group preempted me with a little question. I'm Buster Baxter. Unperturbed by my fierce attitude, the white-haired man answered with a calm smile. Alright, Suda. <laughs> You know, just minor, it's not going to be that big of a deal. It's just, you know, separating this lifelong commitment that you've made to another person. The magazine article I'd read minutes before flashed vividly before my eyes. Currently arranging for a divorce. In a heartbeat, my mind connected those words to this lawyer's sudden arrival. Oh? Oh, sure. <laughs> Yumiko, that was a tabloid! That was just fake news. The man's composed face distorted into a scowl at the word magazine. He must have been trying to reach us before that information did. I was wondering when he was going to talk. Hi. With a small movement of the lawyer's hand, the two men who had been hanging back moved quickly toward me. They had me physically subdued before I could even register surprise. One man had slipped behind me and caught my arms into a firm, full melt. What the? How is this allowed? This is a hospital. You go into jail for this. <laughs> the ever stood in front of me like a wall, eliminating any chance of escape. Yes, th this is the thing. S the writing in this game can be really freaking good. But it also can be unbelievably terrible. <laughs> I, th I feel like they had a separate writer just to do the flashback sections. Because like I said, this is engrossing. Like, I've been at this for several hours now, and I don't even notice because of how much I enjoy reading this. But then it seems like an eternity when, uh, at the beginning when it's just a bunch of girls doing psychotic things. <laughs> I screamed desperately, but they weren't the sort of people to flinch at the cries of a young woman. The private wing was never a busy place. Today it was entirely empty. And with the heavy rain drumming down outside, I doubt anyone elsewhere in the building even heard my voice. And of course, against the strength of two fully grown adults, a child like myself was completely powerless. The lawyer's voice had grown cold. It was the all-too-familiar voice of an adult. His words were extremely polite. If anything, that made them all the more frightening. Ignoring my tear-choked plea, he pushed open the door to my mother's hospital room. I was the first to react. The bed sitting by the window, which had always been occupied before, was now empty. In contrast to the perpetually calm lawyer, I was filled with a profound sense of unease. The doctors always made their rounds at this time of day. None of the patients were allowed to move around freely, much less my mother. They'd given her a normal space for the sake of camouflage, but by all rights, she belonged in a room with bars on the window. 
Normally, it wouldn't be unusual to have move a patient only three days from discharge back into the hospital's general ward, but my mother's condition was still delicate. Her physician had decided to handle everything cautiously until the very end. It just wasn't possible that Mom had simply stepped out at this time of day. The doctor had arrived for his daily rounds. For a moment, he simply stared at the bizarre scene inside the room with confusion in his eyes. Is he watching these, like, suited men putting a, like, middle school girl in a full Nelson? Because, um... The Popo gonna take you out. Before the lawyer could stand to offer a greeting, I yelped out from the corner where the man had deposited me. He turned to the nurse at his side for confirmation, a hint of alarm in his voice. The startled nurse looked around the room as if expecting to find my mother hiding in a corner. It was all too much for me to process. Everything was moving forward smoothly only an hour ago, but now we were derailed, hurling rapidly away in darkness and confusion, all of our painstaking work falling apart around us. I had to look for my mother. I had to keep her from finding out about that article. I had to get out of this room away from these people. Countless thoughts stamped wild, stampeded wildly through my head, but there was just one thing that seemed clear to me. I couldn't just sit there waiting. Before anything else, I had to find Mom. And all of a sudden, I remembered. Mm, go, go up to the roof to watch a thunderstorm. The words ran out so clearly in my ears that for a moment I thought I was really there. She was really there, speaking to me. Pushing my way around the man who'd been holding me in a check, I slipped past the doctor and dashed out into the deserted hallway. I heard voices from behind. I ignored them. I didn't have any real proof, but there was nothing else for me to go on, so I had no choice but to cling to my intuition. Taking the stairs two at a time, I headed for the very top of the building. By the time I managed to struggle all the way to the rooftop, my breath was coming in quick, ragged grasps, and my legs were burning beneath me. I was about- I felt about ready to collapse. After all, I'd sprinted from my house to the hospital, and then from Mom's room up to the roof, with barely a pause in between. But my exhaustion was the last thing on my mind. I threw myself against the door with the last of my momentum, swinging it wide open. Alone in the dark, engulfed by the roar of the rainstorm, I screamed for my mother. It was coming down so hard now that the mist was rising from the bare concrete. Even seeing across the rooftop was a challenge. Naturally enough, given the weather, I couldn't make out any signs of human presence. Oh, I just realized this is probably why Yumiko likes being on the roof in the present time, because it probably reminds her of the promise that she made to her mom. But just as I muttered those words, a white shadow stirred in the darkness. It was a human being, a woman dressed in the white clothes of a patient, standing in the rain. From her height and the length of her hair, I realized at once it was my mother. I splashed through the puddles to her side. She was staring blankly up into the sky, battered by the powerful rain, her entire body utterly soaked. I grabbed my mother by the shoulder and shook her frantically, trying to catch her attention. But her eyes were fixed on the sky. She didn't so much as budge. It was obvious at a glance that something was terribly wrong. Halfway through the sentence, I noticed something lying on the ground at the very edge of my peripheral vision. It was flapping around in the wind. I had the feeling I'd seen it before. Not that long ago, in fact. That cover. That tasteful painting. The work of a well-known artist. Those headlines set in a restrained professional font. The magazine containing the article was lying at my mother's feet. My hand slipped off her shoulder. I staggered backward, barely staying on my feet. Why had this happened? Why did everything have to fall apart just when we were finally starting to move forward? Why was my mother standing there soaking wet? Why did she have that blank expression on her face? Many questions bubbled to the surface of my mind. None of them had answers. They just sat there, suspended in my mind, stagnating, until they putrefied into a pool of solid sludge. Mm -hmm. My mother fixed her lifeless eyes on mine. I was startled. It was the first time for as long as I could remember that my mother had looked me straight in the face. 
But that was, without a doubt, the worst possible way for that chain to be broken. What? There was no light in Mom's eyes. The words she spoke posed a question, but there was nothing like actual curiosity behind them. It was the voice of a machine. I wanted desperately to convince myself she was joking, but no matter how I tried, I couldn't make myself believe it. The evidence before my eyes was simply too powerful. So she was so disturbed by the news that she lost her memory? That's not how that works. Mom's face was paler than white, and at the center of her wide eyes, there were two bottomless dark wells where her pupils had been. Oh, we saw those pupils in Michiru's bad ending. Those tiny spots of black seemed more vast and more profound than the black sky stretching out endlessly above us. I was standing on the edge of an abyss, and I was afraid. It felt as though I might fall into those pools of darkness and disappear. But I couldn't stop staring. I couldn't avert my eyes from the thing that was trying to swallow me whole. After all, she was the only person left in the world who'd ever acknowledged my existence. I called out to her, praying the word might pull her back from across the chasm that separated us. But it was too wide. My voice was too weak. I was, I was too weak. I shrunk away just one step. My heel slid backward across the wet roof. Uh... That took a very long time to load! That was like almost ten full seconds. And then, for just a moment, it felt as though my body was floating. Disoriented by a sharp impact to my backside, I didn't realize that I had been pushed out of the way until I saw the doctor moving past me. As I sat stunned on the wet concrete, they took my vacant-eyed mother in their arms. They were carrying her off like an oversized doll. Away from me, to some place I didn't know. Pushing myself up off the ground, screaming, I ran toward her. I didn't make it three steps before another nurse caught me in her arms. Flashback's gonna absolutely have to be split into multiple VODs. Rising above the pattering of the black rain, a baleful roar filled the air, crawling up from the depths of the earth, demolishing everything in its path. That sound, like a massive boulder tumbling re relentlessly across the world, merged with the scene before my eyes and engraved itself violently onto my heart. Yeah, that's it. I tried to follow with my eyes as they carried her away. I strangled out one final cry. In response, the world filled with intense light, as though a dozen cameras had flashed at once. For a moment, I was dazzled. And by the time my vision returned to normal, there was nothing left to see. No, not quite nothing. On that otherwise empty roof, one waterlogged magazine remained. It was dissolving by now, paper melting away, ink blurring into in in illegibility, but my memory of the truth it contained wouldn't disappear so easily. My broken mother was gone. The doctor who had smiled and told me that we should we'd be leaving the hospital was gone. I was absolutely alone. I crumbled where I stood. Okay, that... That stock water splash sound effect kind of kills the mood of the scene a little bit. My knees hit the ground first, then my hands, then my face. The wet concrete was pleasantly cold against my cheek. Maybe if I lay here long enough, I would melt away and disappear, just like that magazine. The ground was cold, but my body was hot. I'd used up everything I had. I was empty. I'd given up on the very idea of moving. The merciless rain continued to pour down on me. Jet black rain, even though it wasn't night. The vicious dark water pooled around me, creeping up my body as if to swallow me whole. Well, this is about as dark and sad as the other flashbacks. Actually, it's not as dark as the other flashbacks. Mm. 
different kind of dark, maybe. Sometimes I hate that this country has four seasons. Just when I'm finally starting to forget, an autumn wind reminds me of a whispered insult. Winter skies bring back cold and lonely memories. And in summer, when the sudden evening storms arrive, I'm torn apart with every clap of thunder. Again and again, until there's nothing left. One year after my mother's relapse, things had quieted down. The commotion at the hospital created a bit of a stir around town, but it didn't take long for the talk to trickle to a halt. For one thing, the main character in the story was no longer a resident. And even our cold-hearted country gossip seemed hesitant to turn a gravely ill woman's condition into one of their nasty little jokes. I was absent from school for a week after the incident, recovering from the shock and a mild case of pneumonia, but my life eventually re returned to its normal rhythm. That would be the superficial summary, at least. The trauma of reading that magazine article led to a dramatic downturn in my mother's condition. She was now suffering from acute memory loss. Convenient! Her physician, my grandparents, my father, and me. We were all strangers to Mom now. Everyone she met slipped out of her mind within minutes. These symptoms were far beyond anything a local hospital was equipped to handle. Soon after the incident, Mom was transferred to a specialized psychiatric institution in North Kanto. Hey, isn't that where Pokemon takes place? The Kanto region? Ironically enough, that divorce never actually came to pass. Perhaps my father backed off out of concern for his public image. That, or was it some part of part of some conditional legal arrangement? I don't know. One thing, however, was perfectly clear. The connection between the Sakaki and Kawamoto houses had been severed. My two families spent the first months after the incident squabbling by proxy about legal issues and the care of their mutual burdens. In the end, the Sakaki continued to cover my mother's medical expenses, but they were no longer providing supplementary support to the Kawamoto family's floundering business. しばらくは我慢をしてくれんか。歴史のある川本の家がこんな粗末な生活をするようになるなんて。しかもあの子の面倒まで見なければいけないなど、こんなバカな話がありますか。Jeez. That's what Yumiko should be saying. Even long after the matter was settled, my grandparents never seemed to tire of moaning about the unfairness of it all. And, of course, as the easiest target of their bitterness, I once again found myself wedged between a rock and a hard place. I had the bare minimum required for a normal life. They always kept up appearances, after all, but not a day went by when I didn't hear sarcastic, scornful words from the shadows. I went to a silent school and returned to a silent home. I'd lost my refuge. I'd lost my hope. All I could do was suffer quietly. <laughs> 